Good morning, everyone. As you heard, this um, talk is going to be uh, recorded. So our uh, speaker today is um, Dr. Ben Wingham from uh, University of uh, California, Los Angeles. And the work he has been done, doing uh, in the center is on particle in cell simulation of stimulated Raman scattering in magnetic field. Um, and we are working closely with him uh, to carry out experiments. So uh, he will be talking about um, the peak simulations he has done in support of this project. Uh, thank you, Ben, and please go ahead. Thank you, Farhat. Um, it's my pleasure to be talking to you all this morning. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, Roman Lee, Frank Sung, and Warren Mori from UCLA. Um, and then others through UCSD, the University of Warwick and General Comics. Um, we've had, I think, a very fruitful collaboration on this project. So as, as a very general outline of what I'll be talking about, I'll talk about um, the background, particularly for stimulated Raman scattering and for nonlinear electron plasma waves, um, both of which are, um, can have um, very complex interactions with an external magnetic field. So um, first I'll talk just generally about stimulated Raman scattering, generally about nonlinear electron plasma waves. And then I'll talk about the impact of an external magnetic field that we found that these can have. Um, so the center, as I'm sure you all appreciate, is studying matter under extreme conditions um, with, with lasers and with plasmas. Here I've shown far four particular use cases um, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is a nip hole rom where um, lasers irradiate the interior of the hole rom in order to drive the implosion of the, a fuel pellet. The lasers have to propagate through plasmas and you have to be careful about how the lasers interact with the plasmas um, as, as they propagate through and create the X-ray drive for the fusion. Um, this is an experiment that was done by Adam Higginson, where we have a laser coming in and interacting with a gas jet. Um, so this is also the interaction of a laser with the plasma. In this case, it created hot electrons from forward scatter, um, which is what we studied here with the hot electron spectrum. Um, NIF itself can be used as a platform. This is an experiment um, uh, to do equation of state measurements by measuring shock velocities here again, you do have to be careful since this is used in the NIP platform of how lasers propagate through plasmas, um, even though that wasn't the direct, um, it wasn't directly being measured in the, this, uh, to measure the shock velocity, you do have to be careful if it's part of the platform. And for something like Mario's um, experiments on looking at collisionless shocks, here the lasers irradiate foils, which break the plasmas, you have two, uh, counter swinging plasmas here, which create the collision of shock. Um, so here as well, lasers, um, you know, and plasmas have a complex interplay and you have to be careful about how they potentially interact with each other. With regard to lasers and plasmas and magnetic fields, um, in some regions, in, in some regimes, magnetic fields can naturally be of interest. For example, with these collision of shocks, um, one thing under investigation is uh, whether they're mediated by uh, the Weibull instability, collisionless shocks can, in astrophysical settings can occur in magnetized environments just naturally. Um, in an environment like at NIF, this is um, just a general schematic of what imposing an external magnetic field might look for, like for a NIF target. This shows you the, the interior of the whole ROM here with the fuel pellet. And then this is an external view where coils are wrapped around the whole realm to create an axial magnetic field. Um, so this has been posited as something that could potentially be useful to control and access novel regimes in inertial confinement fusion. For example, if you apply the magnetic field, you'll be altering the heat transport um, of what it is that you're driving or the plasma interior to the whole realm. And if you impose the magnetic field, you're also gonna be altering the interaction of the laser the laser beams with the plasma that's interior to the whole realm. 
So lasers propagating through plasmas can be unstable to a variety of instabilities. Here, I'm gonna be talking about stimulated Raman scattering, um, which is the decay of the laser into an electron plasma wave in the scattered light wave. There's also Brillouin scattering where you have uh, the decay into an ion wave. There's two plasmon decay. Um, all of these can be important in inertial confinement fusion specifically. Generally speaking, um, when you have a laser incident into a plasma, uh, you might have little bits of scattered light that are around. If some of the scattered light beats with the laser beam um, to create a ponder motive drive, the ponder motive drive can um, reinforce density fluctuations in the plasma. And if those um, density fluctuations in turn beat with the laser to reinforce the scattered light wave, you get a parametric um, instability where these feed back on each other. Um, in order to get a resonant interaction, you have to have a frequency matching and wave number matching between the daughter waves and the incident waves. Um, and then the largest growth naturally occurs when the um, frequencies naturally satisfy the dispersion relations for the, for the waves. So here, this is just a basic dispersion relation for light. Uh, and for electron plasma waves. Um, Raman scattering can be detriment, detrimental to inertial confinement fusion because it can reflect the laser energy. Um, it can make the laser energy go where you don't want it to go. And it can generate hot electrons, which threaten to preheat the target. The hot electrons that you hear about with stimulated Raman scattering are electrons that um, have been resonantly uh, accelerated by the electron plasma wave, the daughter electron plasma wave. And these, these are accelerated during the process of Landau damping. So this is just a, um, a general picture of a Gaussian distribution function for the electrons. So there, there may be a main part of the distribution function. And then out in the tail of the dis distribution function, you have particles which might be traveling at the same velocity as the phase velocity of the electron plasma wave. So if you think of the electron electric potential of the wave, particles that are traveling at the same uh, phase velocity of the wave can bounce in this potential well. And when you look at this in phase space, this is an orbit of a trapped particle in, in phase space. And by trapped, we just mean that it um, executes oscillations here in the potential well of the wave as it's traveling at the same, the same velocity as the phase speed of the wave. These resonant particles, when, when you land out damp the wave, initially um, the particles are just accelerated by the wave. Let's say they, they go from the phase velocity up to the, um, some phase velocity plus a, um, some higher velocity. When they get to the bottom of the potential well and start going up on the other side um, and then start bouncing back in this potential well, they start um, giving that energy and, and momentum back to the wave rather than taking it out of the wave. Um, so this was studied um, kind of in the early stages of looking at nonlinear effects on plasma waves. The damping rate that you get with um, Landau damping is true in, in kind of the linear damping state of the wave. But then as particles begin to bounce in the potential well and give energy and momentum back to the wave, the plasma wave damping rate can decrease. And ultimately when these particles phase mix so that there's just as many taking energy as giving energy back or similarly with momentum, the electron plasma wave damping rate can asymptote to zero. Um, and that can completely change the growth rate of Raman scattering if you get um, the wave existing for times that are longer than the bounce time of the particles. It can also change the frequency. The, um, so we have the imaginary part of the frequency and the real part of the frequency. The real part of the frequency can also um, decrease. And if the frequency changes, then you disrupt the frequency matching conditions and you disrupt the frequency resonance for the instability. Um, this is kind of a, a simple one-dimensional picture. In um, higher dimensions, it can be much more complicated because you have a spatial envelope, you have um, different amplitudes in different regions of space. Um, you can get um, different regions of damping and frequency inside of um, 
kind of a self-contained wave packet. So you can get longitudinal and transverse modulations. You can get um, and it, um, transverse etching on the, on the side of the waves, which makes it look like the wave is localizing. You can get something like self-focusing, um, a whole range of nonlinear effects can affect Raman scattering if the plasma wave is very kinetic. So this presents a real problem for trying to model Raman scattering for ICF relevant parameters um, due to the wealth of kinetic effects that might affect the instability. This is um, a contour plot of a speckled laser beam going from left to right and undergoing SRS where the, the laser energy is depleted here because um, plasma waves have grown and are scattering laser light then going from right to left, they're backscattering the light. So the, the plasma waves that are generated, you can see here, this is a plasma wave from a simulation. It has, um, it has the transverse localization, it has the modulations. It can be affected by the nonlinear effects on the damping and the frequency. Um, a whole range of these really complicate trying to model this in, the instability in this, these regimes. Um, it also complicates things that, um, you get a variety of behaviors at different spatial scales. So you can consider everything up from the, um, the spatial modulation of the laser, say, which is trying to be smooth by various laser smoothing techniques. Um, neighboring speckles can interact with each other by sending uh, waves and particles between them. Even on the scale of the plasma wave wavelength itself, you get these nonlinear effects and you can get localized electron distribution functions, which have these hot tails, which modify the damping and the frequency of the wave. So when you introduce a magnetic field into this, the magnetic field alters the motion of resonant particles um, and there, thereby can really um, kind of almost surprisingly alter the plasma wave dynamics and the dynamics of stimulated Raman scattering. In the 70s, Sagdeev and Shapiro looked at the influence of a transverse magnetic field on Landau damping. So this is a particle, a trap particle oscillating in space. But if there's a magnetic field coming out of the page, then that causes this bouncing particle to um, move transversely as well as get accelerated transversely in um, velocity space. Dawson also looked at this in the 80s. Um, and this is a picture in velocity space without the magnetic field of oscillating particle would be oscillating about the phase velocity. Um, and in these particular directions, the particle would oscillate like this, but with the magnetic field pointing out of the page, the particle starts to move transversely to um, the direction that it's oscillating. And so it gets accelerated transverse to the direction the wave is moving. Um, and this then acts to help damp the wave as this particle gets accelerated and eventually the B cross B force is greater than the um, electric force that's um, keeping the particle bouncing in the potential well and the particle gets detrapped. Um, and then this larger, um, this larger orbit is just a cyclotron orbit. So this is the basic schematic where you have an electron plasma wave, you have electrons which might bounce in the well but then they get accelerated in transverse direction by the motion action of the magnetic field. Uh, initially, this led to other interests such as surfactant acceleration of particles, acceleration by um, magnetized waves, but really the literature on the kinetic dynamics of electron plasma waves and magnetic fields is relatively sparse. Um, so, we decided to look a little bit more in depth at this, particularly since we had seen the magnetic fields affect Raman scattering. This is the basic picture. This is a schematic of the electric potential of a plasma wave. The particle can be trapped if its um, velocity is uh, within the phase velocity by this factor called V trap. So this depends on the amplitude of the wave and the wave number of the wave. In the wave frame, um, what happens if you impose a perpendicular magnetic field is that you get an acceleration, which is transverse to the wave, which depends on that. This is like the B cross B force. So you have Vx, the 
is in this direction, you have the magnetic field, you get an acceleration of the particle transverse to the wave. You also get something like an oscillatory motion in, in Vx um, in the velocity along the direction that the wave is propagating. So this is like um, an oscillation at the bounce frequency. Without the magnetic field, this would just be the, um, the bounce frequency of the wave, but it's modified when you have the magnetic field so that the bounce, the effective bounce frequency is larger with the magnetic field than without it. You also have a little bit of a slippage of the particle. So the particle starts to slip backwards in the wave um, as it's bouncing and traveling with the wave. Um, both of these effects can alter the nonlinear dynamics of how particles resonantly interact with the wave. Um, and the particles resonantly interact with the wave until they get detrapped. So once the particle is no longer detrapped, it no longer resonantly interacts with the wave. And they can get detrapped if they get accelerated to sufficient transverse velocity um, so that now the transverse velocity, velocity crossed with V is larger than the, um, than the field which is keeping it trapped. Um, if the wave gets sufficiently damped, then the amplitude of the wave decreases and the particle can get detrapped. Or simply if there are different regions in which the wave exists, then the particle can get detrapped if it travels into different regions. So now on, onto the simulation part of our, our investigation. Um, we use the Cyrus code, which is developed at UCLA and at IST. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about very simple simulations. Um, we used OSIRIS to conduct a very fundamental investigation of plasma waves and magnetic fields. And we did this by looking at simulations of just a single wavelength, uh, length to the simulation domain. So we drove, the, um, we drove an electron plasma wave with an external field um, over two wave periods. Um, and the, the box itself was periodic. So this was like an infinite wave frame. Um, and then after we drove it for two wave periods, we turned the driver off and we looked at what the evolution of the wave was after we turned the driver off. So these are in a relatively um, kinetic regime. Um, K lambda to by 0 0.25 to 0.4 corresponds to a phase velocity, which is on approximately three to four times the thermal velocity of the particles. So the phase velocity is you know, getting close enough to the thermal velocity that it starts to trap a lot of particles. The normalized magnetic fields are relatively small. So um, the cyclotron frequency to the plasma frequency has a ratio on the order of um, kind of hundredths to a thousandths. The driver duration is relatively short. And then the, um, we looked at it for about a thousand inverse um, omega p. So what I'm plotting here is the amplitude of the mode that we drove. Um, it's just a single wavelength box. So um, we had the plasma wave with one wavelength in the box and we looked at that particular mode. Uh, we looked at the mo that mode amplitude versus time. So this is the region over which that mode is driven. We turned the driver off here. And then we looked at the wave amplitude evolve for a variety of different magnetic field amplitudes. There are a number of things to notice about this plot. One is you can notice oscillations at the bounce frequency. So this is the stage at which the wave initially linearly land out damps. Once the particles start to bounce in the wave um, and give momentum and energy back to the wave, then you get the amplitude coming back up. And this here would be the first bounce period. And then it bounces again. Um, and eventually kind of in the, in the ideal case, this would um, evolve to some steady state. As you um, turn on the magnetic field, um, you can see that the acceleration of the trapped particles in the magnetic field disrupts the nonlinear dynamics when the mag from when the magnetic field is zero. So the magnetic field equal to zero is, is the red curve that's on top. And then with the blue and the yellow and kind of the lighter blue, those progressively um, decrease down here until all the way at the highest magnetic field strength here for this plot, the amplitude is just continuously damped down to zero. Um, 
So to verify that this is happening at the same time that particles are being accelerated along the wavefront in the transverse direction, we looked at the electron phase space. This, uh, the one direction here is the direction that the wave is propagating. This is the direction in which um, particles could potentially be trapped in the wave. This is the transverse direction to the wave. So here you can see initially particles traveling close to B phase, which would be around here, would be trapped and accelerated by the wave. And then you can see that they start to get accelerated in this direction. So this is confirming that the particles are getting accelerated transverse to the direction of the wave and to the magnetic field. Another thing to notice about this is that the bounce period is getting shorter. So I mentioned that the magnetic field alters the bounce frequency of the wave. Here, um, the bounce period isn't getting shorter here just due to the damping of the wave. If the bounce period was being altered simply due to the fact that the wave amplitude was getting changed, um, the wave amplitude getting smaller would mean a smaller bounce frequency, um, which in turn would mean a, mean a longer bounce period. It's actually due to the fact that the bounce period itself was modified by the presence of the magnetic field. So the, um, the effective oscillation frequency of the velocity goes up and the period gets shorter. Interestingly, um, so here, um, the maximum was 0 0.004. If you start going to even higher magnetic field amplitudes, um, it looks like the wave starts to um, come back. So the lowest uh, B is equal to zero is the black line here for reference. Um, B is 0 0.01, now is, is down here. Then you have blue as higher magnetic field, then the green and then the yellow. Um, so this periodicity is not the bounce period or the cyclotron period. It's rather um, the beat between the frequency of other modes that are in the plasma. So once you start getting to a higher magnetic field amplitude, you start getting um, Bernstein modes in the plasma. We, we can look at the frequency spectrum for um, different wave amplitudes. Um, here is the mode that we're driving. This is the driven mode. Um, and then um, for very small magnetic fields, um, the cyclotron frequency you know would be very small and these um, the Bernstein modes that might exist would all be very close to this. Um, here you can see very distinct modes that are neighboring it. And if you look at the um, frequency difference between these determines the periodicity that you see in the, the amplitude here. So we've looked at these for a variety of amplitudes um, and a variety of wave numbers and magnetic field amplitudes. Similar um, qualitative properties are observed in all of these cases, where basically after you turn off the driver, you get some oscillation at the bounce frequency. As you start increasing the amplitude of the wave, then you get um, the wave becomes progressively more damped. But then as you start increasing it past some threshold, then, um, then the, the evolution of the amplitude is more like the, the beat between the mode that you're trying to drive along with neighboring Bernstein modes. Um, and then for, for, you know, for, for different wave number or different K lambda to buy, you affect how kinetic the wave is, meaning how, how much the, the wave interacts with a given population of electrons. Um, but you can see similar qualitative properties here. In two dimensions, um, the relative importance of various kinetic effects depends on the wave width and the wave amplitude. So um, those of us at UCLA have done simulation studies of multidimensional electron plasma waves. Um, and we found that there's a dissipation effect on the side of the waves due to the fact that um, you might say have a non-linearly Landau damp state in the center of the wave, but not on the edges. And you have particles which are moving transversely and might damp the wave on the sides more than they damp it um, in the center. Overall, what that does is it acts to, um, it has a transverse localization effect. Um, 
and then in even higher amplitudes, the waves can begin to filament. What I'm plotting here on the left is just successive snapshots of a one wavelength simulation where you can see the localization of the wave. Here on the right, what I'm plotting is I'm averaging over the, the X direction and I'm plotting it as the um, transverse direction versus time. So here you can see the localization rate of the wave, of the width of the wave. You can see the bounce period here. You can see that the wave damps away. Um, this simulation is now for a larger amplitude where you can get a little bit of an enhancement in the amplitude due to something that's like the self-focusing effect. Although this isn't strictly self-focusing because you get much higher amplitude if all of the wave energy was focused towards the center. Um, so this is mainly just a result of a very small amount of self-focusing, but mainly the width of the wave is affected by the motion of particles entering and exiting the wave um, transversely. And then with the frequency shift, we also get a filamentation-like effect at even higher amplitudes. So this all has to be taken into account when you're looking at the magnetic field effects in, on multidimensional waves. Um, without the magnetic field, say here, the, the, um, you can see the bounce period. You can see the evolution of the width of the plasma wave. Um, you could see that the amplitude doesn't really change that much. It's kind of in a nonlinearly um, damp state along the center of the wave. When you put in an external magnetic field, um, the, wave, the wave width here, there's a little bit of an asymmetry here because particles that are trapped in the wave might move along the same propagation direction as the wave. But then since there's a transverse magnetic field, they get preferentially, um, those that are in the center of the wave get preferentially rotated in, in this direction from zero up to more positive why so there's there's less of a localization here than there is here there's a little bit of an asymmetry to the the bright spot that occurs here um and then as you go to even higher magnetic field amplitudes then you can see that the wave more completely damps away just like we saw in one dimension and at even higher uh, amplitudes of the magnetic field you see the beat come back as the the mode that you're driving then beats with, with other modes that exist due to uh, the magnetic magnetized plasma waves. Oh, now I'll, I'll switch gears a little and talk about what happens in stimulated Raman scattering. Um, so with stimulated Raman scattering, the si situation is much more complex because now you aren't dealing just with the plasma wave itself, but also with the interaction of the plasma wave with, with two light waves. One, the incident light wave, which is decaying, and, and then the other one is the scattered light wave. Um, I'll talk mainly about uh, one-dimensional simulations first, where we just have a constant intensity laser driving a, a box, which is on the order of a speckle length, say for an F8 laser beam at NIF. It's kind of on the order of 100 microns in length. Um, ranging over a couple hundred EV to several keV for the temperature, and kind of on the range of 2% to 20% of, of the critical density for the electron density. And then um, the laser beams, I'll be talking about 10 to the 15th and 10 to the 16th watts per square centimeter. When I go up to 2D, these will have a, uh, a width on the order of a speckle width. And then the magnetic fields that I'm looking at, again, have a, a cyclotron frequency uh, relative to the, to the plasma frequency on the order of a couple of thousands. So relatively small, but still pretty effective at altering the dynamics of the instability. So first, we've been looking at this across an entire parameter regime. Um, so th this is quite, quite a large region of, of parameters in which to try and look at the behavior of stimulated Raman scattering. Horizontally, I'm, I'm plotting density. Vertically, I'm here's the thermal velocity. This is the electron temperature. So this is like the, the square of this scale. And then the contours on this 
who represent k lambda Debye values. And so you can think of this as, as you go from point one to point two to point three and higher, um, <clears throat> the phase velocity of the wave that's getting closer to the bulk of the distribution function, your, um, the, the phase velocity then is able to interact with a larger number of particles that are closer to the bulk of the distribution. As, as you get up here, you get a very strongly damped plasma wave. If you're driving it down here, it's not so damped. Um, so this is kind of the cooler, hotter plasma. Uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the hotter, less dense plasma. This is the cooler, more dense plasma. SRS tends to be more unstable in this regime and less unstable in this regime. So when you look at the, the reflectivity that you get from Raman scattering for 10 to the 16th um, drive intensity, the reflectivity here is relatively minimal. Here it's much larger. And then there's kind of an intermediate regime where you can get some interesting kinetic effects contributing to the, the reflectivity. Because as soon as you start getting to where K lambda divides about 0.3, you start getting into a regime where if the particles, if, if enough of a plasma wave is driven that particles can start bouncing, once you get the particles start to bounce, they start to alter the damping rate of the plasma wave. Then you start to alter the growth rate and threshold of the instability. So you get into something which is called more of a kinetically inflated regime. Um, but th this is kind of a general picture where you have a, a lot of reflectivity and, and not so much. I should mention, by the way, that, that all of these classes are where we've done, done simulations and we've tried to interpolate between those to, to give you the color map. All of these classes now are one-dimensional simulations where we looked at the Raman reflectivity for a laser drive, which is 10 to the 15th, and one which is 10 to the 16th. And we looked at how the reflectivity of Raman scattering was affected with the external magnetic field. So, here it's a 40 Tesla magnetic field. These are percent changes. Um, so let me start with 10 to the 15th first. In, in this regime, remember, you don't have a whole lot of Raman scattering to start with. Here, here you have a lot of Raman scattering and kind of in this intermediate regime, you have kind of a more moderate amount of Raman uh, reflectivity. The blue color here represents um, the magnetic field having the mitigating effect on Raman scattering. So when it's blue, you can think that the magnetic field is decreasing the Raman scattering that you have. When it's more of the reddish color, you're increasing the Raman scattering that you have. So here, when you get to point three and you have a lot of kinetic effects, the magnetic field can really decrease the reflectivity that you get from Raman scattering. It kind of occurs here at a very sweet spot of you know, point where the contour is 0.3. You see this entire blue region. That region shifts somewhat up when you drive it more intensely. So 10 to the 16th versus 10 to the 15th. Um, that blue region shifts upward somewhat and you start getting this region growing more, which is more of an enhancement of the reflectivity due to the magnetic field. So I'll talk about a couple of cases that illustrate some things that are happening here. Um, let's look at this particular region of space where the temperature is about 3 keV and the density is about 13% of the critical density. Um, this particular set of parameters is what I looked at in work that we published in PhysRev E. Here I'm plotting um, without the magnetic field and with a 50 Tesla perpendicular field the evolution of the plasma waves. So this is time, this is space. The laser drives it from left to right. This is just one dimensional. And um, it takes some, a while for the plasma waves to grow, but then the instability grows, the plasma waves grow, they saturate, and then they start to convect from left to right in the, the same direction that the laser is propagating. And then there's a certain periodicity as the instability saturates and then recurs um, saturates and recurs again, and et cetera. With the magnetic field, you can see a whole lot less plasma wave activity than you do without it. And that's because the plasma wave is contributing to uh, the damping 
of the plasma wave that's being driven by the instability. If we look at the, the electron base space, this is the direction that the laser and the that the pump laser and that the plasma wave are propagating. These are the particles that are trapped by the plasma wave and accelerated with a magnetic field. Now, again, you see particles being accelerated in the transverse direction. So if I look at a movie of this, you can see initially they'll be accelerated, then they get um, transversely accelerated, then they execute gyro motion. You get kind of continual bursts up here as um, you get successive bursts of the instability, which accelerate particles and transverse to the direction of the wave. You know, they get detrapped and then they execute their gyro motion. We looked at a particular, um, particular particles within the simulation to try and identify what was happening to them. This is the example of a particle that gets, initially it's um, executing its gyro motion in the magnetic field. It gets over here where now it's um, resonant with the plasma wave because it has a velocity which is equal to the plasma wave phase velocity. Then you can see here it starts to um, it starts to bounce in the wave, but it also gets accelerated. Um, it's getting progressively more py, so it's it's getting accelerated transverse to the the direction the wave is propagating, and and then eventually it gets detrapped. And when it gets detrapped. It now has a gyro orbit, which is larger because it has more energy than it started with. So this is an example of a particle that could take energy and momentum out of the wave. When we look at the scaling of reflectivity versus laser intensity, this is without a magnetic field. As you start um, increasing the amplitude of the magnetic field, this reflectivity now decreases, um, which is due to the effect of this kinetic damping of particles that are interacting with the magnetic field. Now let's look at another case. So here, this is the more strongly driven 10 to the 16th um, laser pump amplitude. And we're looking at um, something which is cooler, kind of and less dense or, over in this regime where we notice the red. Um, this is what the um, what the elect well the what the spectrum of the plasma wave electric field looks like. If you looked at the Bohm Gross dispersion relation, the Bohm Gross dispersion relation would would come out something like this. And I mentioned that at the very beginning that um, Raman scattering tends to be most resonant where you get a plasma wave which falls on the natural dispersion relation, which would be around here. Um, but since there are, this by the way is, is without the magnetic field. Since the plasma wave and the Raman scattering instability are being driven so strongly, and um, the, the plasma wave that's being driven interacts with a lot of particles, it's very close to the kinetic regime, and you get a large nonlinear frequency shift to the wave, and you get a variety of other kinetic effects, all of which contribute to making this. Um, kind of whole swath of activity and frequency in K-space. Um, if you look just at the, the wave number versus time for that electric field, here's the, the K for the backscattered plasma wave that's being driven. You can see initially it starts out here and then it shifts up to higher K. That matches with the frequency shift downward here along this line. If you impose an external magnetic field, which disrupts the, the interaction of the trapped particles with the wave, you can get um, less of this frequency shift, you get a less of the frequency, a less of the wave number shift in K-space. So you can see this, this mode say that stays in a more confined region of K-space than, than this one does. And it tends to, um, last longer and be just a little more intense, which contributes overall to, to maintaining the resonance, the Raman scattering resonance over a longer period of time and contributing to more reflectivity when you have the magnetic field than when you don't. So this is a case in which the reflectivity is enhanced when the magnetic field is present. 
now let's go back to the case um, which I originally talked about, but not, not in one dimension, in two dimensions. This is a snapshot in space of the electric field of the plasma waves where the, the laser is driving the system from left to right. The plasma wave and backscatter then propagates also from left to right. And you can see the modulation of the wave. You can see the transverse localization. Um, you can see some of the nonlinear frequency effects because this is slightly bowed. When you have the magnetic field and particles which are traveling from left to right get rotated upwards, you can see that there's less damping of the wave on the on this side of the wave than there is on this side. So there's, there's a multi-dimensional dissipation of the electron plasma wave when you have a magnetic field that's present. Overall, however, um, with a perpendicular field, you still um, act to decrease the, the, the reflectivity from Raman scattering. Um, this now is looking at the reflectivity scaling as you increase the amplitude of the magnetic field that's being imposed. With a perpendicular field, the reflectivity decreases um, due to disrupting the two-dimensional plasma wave damping. Um, interestingly, when you impose a parallel magnetic field, the reflectivity increases slightly. And so with the parallel field, you're actually acting to constrain the transverse motion of the trapped particles. So rather than leaving, leaving the spatial region transversely, they can stay more confined to the wave um, and act in a sense to, to, um, to keep the wave a, a little more kinetically driven. On the other hand, if you look more in this region of space and for the higher laser drive, um, with a more intense drive, you tend to drive the plasma waves um, a little more chaotically. So this looks more violent than the, than the slide that I was just showing to you. But if you impose a perpendicular magnetic field, um, you see a lot more activity in, in space for the plasma waves than you do with the parallel field. So remember I mentioned for the parallel field, you act to constrain the trapped particles to move along the direction that the plasma wave is propagating. Whereas perpendicularly, we might've thought that the, the trapped particles would, get, would move outside of the region of the wave. But here they actually act to, um, there's not just the damping of the wave that we have to think about, there's also the frequency um, and kind of the multi-dimensional nature of this, the spatial dynamics. So if I, if I look at the diagnostic again, where what I'm doing is I'm averaging actually over the entire box length in, in the longitudinal direction, and I'm plotting, I'm plotting the transverse direction here versus time. So it takes a while for the instability to grow, but then the plasma waves grow. They reach some amplitude, they saturate, um, and then, then you get kind of a saturation and recurrence. You get a periodicity in the recurrence. Without the magnetic field, you, you get some reflected light. This is reflectivity versus time. So you get an initial burst of reflectivity and then successive bursts of reflectivity. You can see without the magnetic field, the plasma wave does localize here. When you have the perpendicular field, here you have much less of a localization effect. Um, and so the, the magnetic field is kind of having an interesting effect on the kinetic dynamics, of, particularly with respect to the multidimensional dissipation of the wave. And you end up getting more reflectivity in this case than you do without the, mag, the perpendicular field. And with the parallel field, now you have more of an enhanced um, transverse localization of the wave. And the reflectivity you get is kind of on the same order as without the field. And finally, there's one, one other mechanism for Raman scattering enhancement that I want to talk about. Um, so both of the daughters and Raman scattering can themselves decay. This is a simple, um, these arrows represent the, the magnitude of the wave number. So if you have, say, an incident pump, which has this K, you'll drive a, a 
electron plasma wave, which has this K, and a backscattered plasma wave, a uh, light wave having this K for stimulated Raman backscatter. This particular light wave that's being scattered can itself act as a pump for an additional backscattering process. So the scattered light wave is also susceptible to backscatter, and this is called rescatter. Since it has a different frequency, um, there's only a certain region of this density in which the scattered light wave you know, is susceptible to Raman backscatter. It, it can't be below its, um, below the, it can't be above the quarter critical, um, which means that it's only in this re region of space that rescatter can happen. Um, this in particular has been studied in our group by Roman Lee. But um, if the scattered light itself rescatters, that prevents the, the reflected light that's originally caused by backscatter from being measured at the boundary where we measure reflectivity, which means if, if you only look at the reflectivity, you might not be capturing um, what's fully going on with the original backscatter as well as with the rescatter that could be present. This is um, looking at the mode amplitude versus time going up. This is the mode for backscatter. This is the rescatter and this is forward scatter. Um, so you can see there, there is quite a lot of forward scatter. When you impose a magnetic field, there's, there's less forward scatter. Um, this backscatter now is a little bit um, stronger and it drives stronger bursts of reflected light that come back. So if you look at the time average reflectivity, it kind, kind of just at the boundary, you would measure reflectivity here, which is larger than the reflectivity here where you have a lot of rescatter going on, which is reflecting the light and being it, uh, preventing it from being captured within this diagnostic. Finally, just as one final comment, the electron, oops, the electron plasma wave itself can decay too. Um, so the electron plasma wave from backscatter can itself decay. Um, it can decay into an ion acoustic wave and another electron plasma wave. This is now the K for the ion acoustic wave. This is for the, it decays into a, a backward plasma wave, which has relatively the same K, but just in the opposite direction. This tends to affect um, the dynamics when K lambda divided is less than 0.3, which is in this area of the, of the parameter space. So this is kind of a, a novel region to, to move into as well if we were to do these simulations with mobile ions. Um, this is kind of a direction for the future. Um, so just to conclude and show you these results again, um, we've looked at a variety of different cases within this parameter space and looked at how Raman reflectivity has changed with the magnetic field. Um, in particular, looking at how the magnetic field acts to decrease the reflectivity when you get um, uh, enhanced kinetic damping due to the effect of the magnetic field on the resonant particles when you increase the drive and you end up driving larger amplitude plasma waves in this region of space, say you might get a very strong nonlinear frequency shift. Um, so if the magnetic field acts to alter the frequency shift, which is detuning the instability, and you pull it back more into resonance, you can get something like an enhancement of the reflectivity. Um, and then I've talked about rescatter as another mechanism which can enhance the reflectivity that you measure as well. So to conclude, even small normalized magnetic fields where the ratio of the cyclotron to the plasma frequency is on the order of a thousandth can um, disrupt the evolution of instability sensitive kinet to kinetic electron plasma wave dynamics, such as Raman scattering. We've looked at the nonlinear damping of plasma waves um, in one, one dimensional as well as in multiple dimensions. We've looked at how Raman scattering can be mitigated by changes to the damping, as well as how it can be enhanced due to changing of the wave resonance, as well as to secondary decays that occur. So there are many avenues of research to pursue. This parameter space is of course very large um, and modeling this phenomenon and its impact is, is very interesting. So. We're continuing to extend our understanding of Raman scattering in magnetic fields. And I'll, I'll just thank my collaborators again and say that this has been a very collaborative effort between 
UCLA, US, UCSD, and University of Warwick. Um, and we hope to continue with various experimental efforts too. So thank you, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, um, Ben, for an excellent talk. Uh, so his uh, Ben's talk is open for questions.